I would like to invite your attention to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. The book of 1 Peter in chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 1 tonight. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 1. As you find your way into the scripture, again, I want to join Brother Brandon in just welcoming everyone that would be here tonight. Going to repeat uh, uh, all that he said, but yet to join in and say that we're just thankful to see each of you as well. And uh, so many are here that are blessed in our heart and we appreciate and thankful for. Uh, but most importantly, we're thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he's the one that makes all this possible. And I pray we never forget that. And uh, tonight... Uh, as we look in the Word of God in 1 Peter in chapter 3, tonight what's on our heart is really, in a lot of ways, at least maybe in my mind, as God has given it to me, it's a continuation from last night. I know uh, there are some here that were not here last night, and we just began uh, with a question uh, uh, to ask you very simply, you know, what does the Lord Jesus Christ mean to you? Uh, not, uh, not only perhaps in what He's done necessarily years ago in your life, but what does He mean to you today? Uh, the how, how precious is he? When you hear the name of Jesus, is it a precious thought that comes to your mind? Are you thankful? Are you glad? Uh, is, he, is he welcome in your heart? Uh, is he, uh, uh, are you very familiar with him? Are you growing in your knowledge of him? Are you seeking him? Do you desire to walk with him in your life? How, how precious is the name of Christ? And as we ended last night, that uh, we kind of just uh, didn't spend a whole lot of time with it, but yet we, we brought the message to a close anyway. Uh, about the fact that the understanding that even our, our, as a child of God, uh, our judgment and, and what we do for the Lord Jesus Christ and how we live our life in response to Him, uh, it, it's going to mean everything one day, and, and, and that's at the judgment seat of Christ and at the day of judgment. Uh, that the only motivation, a lot, a lot of times people do things for a lot of different reasons, and, and perhaps it may be hidden from us the reason why people do what, what they would do uh, but yet it's not hidden to the Lord and, and the only motivation that he honors is a motivation of love for him uh, and love for his people uh, and uh, that's what he, he honors that's what he blesses uh, and uh, those that die without Jesus Christ uh, that, that, that they're going to stand before him and they're, they're going to bow and they're going to confess that he's king of kings and lord of lords and so tonight it's, it's so very vital so very important uh, that we uh, be very careful how we answer you know, the question, what does Jesus mean to us? And tonight I want to continue with that line of thought, but yet I want to extend it out and ask this question. You might say, well, this is going to be the same from last night. Well, just hold on a little bit. Uh, what does Jesus mean to your family? Uh, uh, and I don't mean this uh, in a derogatory way, but, but just to put it in a very simple way, how much do you enjoy the Lord within your family? How familiar is your family to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, tonight, as, as I look out, and, and we understand this, that there's a, uh, uh, the, uh, the truth that churches are made up of families. And a church is only as strong as the families that comprise it. And the families are only going to be as strong as the spiritual leadership that is provided by the husband. And that is along, and, and the wife that is alongside him. So to ask, to ask the married couples here tonight, how, how, you know, how much do you as a married couple enjoy the Lord in your life? How much do you allow him to be an active part in your marriage? Is he discussed at all among you, between you and your, and, and your spouse? You that are here that are, are not yet of age to... Uh, be married, but yet the time's coming quicker than the parents want it to. What is it that, that you look for? What is it that you're looking out? What, what, what kind of qualities are you looking for when it comes to a spouse in the future? Do you consider the Lord in that? Is, what, is, is the Lord's word, is that important to you? You know, I guess we'll go and tell where we're going to end right now at the beginning, but there's going to come a day that you're going to realize that's all that matters. And it'd be a whole lot better if you would understand that today. With that being said, as an introduction, 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's begin here in verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may 
without the word be won by the conversation of the wives while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning let it not be that of outward adorning of plaiting the hair or of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price for after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands even as Sarah obeyed Abraham calling him Lord whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered finally be ye all of one mind having compassion one of another love as brethren be pitiful be courteous not rendering evil for evil nor railing for railing but contrarywise blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing now we're going to stop here in verse 9 we could continue on but we'll stop here in this in this verse in verse 9 and and and, and tonight we want to begin but I, I don't want to dwell too long on the negative side but I must begin on the negative side but I don't want again I'm not going to dwell too long because there's too much good we want to unpack tonight <laughs> uh, very frankly uh, but to begin on the fact that, that listen if you're here today uh, especially as, as, as a young family uh, as, a, as, a, as a married couple uh, that, that to understand that uh, if you are gaining uh, what you think is valuable by looking out into the world I'm here to tell you you're selling yourself short I'm here to tell you tonight that you're, you're selling for that which is less and for that which is a, of, of a, a short term uh, value uh, tonight to, to say that in a different way there are so many people today that if I was to ask them that, that what does marriage mean to you? You know, we, we, we've lived in a time and day in which uh, marriage is as devalued as, uh, as I'm sure at any other time. I don't know. I have, I, I'm not here with any statistics tonight. Uh, but I do know this, that marriage is very much devalued. And, and Satan is the author of it. Uh, and the fact that even, 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 the, 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 even the, uh, what some would even term the bother of, of getting married. And people look at, at, at marriage with, with little to no value. Uh, and if you was to ask them tonight, and I wonder how many of God's people, when you think about your marriage, what is it that you hope to gain out of it? Why would you get married to begin with? Uh, well, because you wanted to, because you had to, because, well, it was, uh, you know, I know that's what I'm supposed to do. That's the next phase in my life. What is it that you're wanting uh, to uh, achieve uh, in your value, in, in your marriage? What is it that you think, if, if, I, have, if I could have the best, best marriage of anyone, you know, how would you define that? How would you qualify that tonight? You know, there's so many that, that, that value, and they put value on the marriage by, by thinking about what I can, uh, listen, acquire uh, here in this life. There's certainly uh, so many people, they look at, at marriage, and they look at, listen, what is it that we can join together and have a common purpose? And that common purpose is simply the acquisition of stuff. It, it is uh, just uh, gaining all of the monetary value that we can gain in, in, in a certain period of time. Listen, that children come along, and listen, so many people th think of children uh, listen, which, are, which is an inheritance from the Lord. And look at that as, listen, that's something that's just dragging them down. Uh, they can't wait to get the children out of the house. But listen, that's something I've got to put time and money into. I've got to get them here. I've got to get them there. And listen, if I can just get my job, if I can just, uh, listen, and get to this certain level, if I can just get raised to this certain position, if I can just, just build upon that retirement, and listen, if I can just have all of this time, listen, if I can retire at such an age, uh, listen, and I can just have all these possessions, the land, uh, the house, uh, listen, the cars, listen, uh, the bank account, if I can just have all that, uh, then I've surely had a successful marriage. And the truth of the matter is, you can't take none of it with you. <laughs> Not a drop in the bucket. You came into this world naked, and that's the way you can listen, you're going to head out. You came in with nothing, Paul says, and you're going to leave with nothing as far as a material value. But yet, there's so many marriages that are devoted, even people who name the name of Christ will have the attitude, yes, I know I'm saved. I know, I, I, listen, I, I, I've trusted in God. I'm saved. I know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But I've got to get to getting after it to get it all I can get out of this life. 
materially speaking. And you may not want to admit that, but you really don't have to if, if we were just to live with you a little while. It might, it might be just plainly evident, you know. But let me begin, as I said, on the negative side. Let me just remind you of some truths. Listen, many places we're going to turn to tonight, try to get across, listen, the, 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 the message that's on our heart. Uh, but I think about it in Luke chapter 12. And listen, let me remind you of, of what Jesus said in Luke in chapter 12. And listen, uh, you, you just examine, you allow God to examine your heart tonight. You, you just have, uh, listen, uh, don't shut me off. You just have a willing ear to listen to what God uh, has for us tonight. And you just compare your marriage. You compare your family and you see how it lines up with the word of God how, what God says is valuable what is it that you're placing importance on listen Luke chapter 12 Jesus said this in verse 15 take heed and beware of covetousness now in Colossians you know he equates covetousness to what anybody know it's idolatry anything you put ahead of God it's an idol he said take heed and beware of covetousness you know you ain't, you ain't got to have something to desire y'all know that right you ain't, you ain't got it. You say, well, preacher, listen, you want, you want thing you got to worry, I'm not rich. Well, you ain't got to be rich to that desire. It. <laughs> Those are things only God sees. It's what motivates you. It's why you get up and go to work. It's why you, you take that, that, that different job. It's why you work out overtime because there are things that you want, things that you want to do, things you want to achieve. It's why you, you push your wife to do this or do that. You push your husband to do this or that. Listen, we got to get ahead. Take heed. And beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That means zero to God. <laughs> man's life consisted not. And he gives the account, which I know you're all familiar with. We're not going to take a lot of time with it other than just to bring it to your attention tonight. They have the parable of, the, of this, this rich fool. <laughs> this rich man who had plenty, and yet it wasn't enough. And that's the thing about covetousness. What you have is never enough. You're never content with what you have. You're never thankful. You always want more. And that's where this man lived his life. And he had made plans. This is what I'm going to do. But he learned far too late in the game that, he, that there was someone who had far more control over his life than he did. And dear friend, the earlier you learn that, the better it's going to be for you. He had great plans for what he was going to do. But God's plans outweighed his plans. <laughs> and he said, he called him a fool. In verse 20, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. This is God speaking. How's that line up with what you want out of your marriage, out of your family? You know, over in Matthew chapter 17, he said, Was a man profit? You gain the whole world and lose his own soul. What, what have you really done? You've taken the only life you're going to live beside eternity, and you just wished it away. And you got eternity. And what have you built it toward that? Tonight, my desire as we come back to 1 Peter chapter 3, what, I, what, what, what is on our heart tonight, and with the help of God, I pray that this can be, be, be brought forth in a manner that you would have a desire to see your marriage, to see your family as God sees it. That there is great potential, uh, listen, uh, of what God can do. And the more families, the more marriages that can see their life, to see what God's blessed them with as God sees it, and they can see their life as not just being 50 years, 60 years, 100 years, but that they can see their life. If you're truly a child of God, your life doesn't end with death. Amen. Only thing that's going to happen then is your mortality is going to be swallowed up into life. <laughs> Brother Stephen, I heard you preach a message on that. I never forgot it. It's a wonderful blessing to my heart. It's just the beginning. But so many of God's children just have this idea like, well, listen, I know when I die and I leave this world, I'm going to go to heaven. But God wants you to see there's some things that if you invest in him now, boy, the payoff is eternal. <laughs> if God is what he ought to be in your home, in your marriage, and you walk with him today, dear friends, it's amazing what all you'll have to thank him for in eternity. And that's what I want to see tonight. And I come back to 1 Peter chapter 3 now as we kind of kind of built the foundation and I want to pick out, I'm going to read a copy of, or, or a portion of the verse uh, that is the center of the message tonight. And I want you to, to see what God has for us in this verse. 
in 1 Peter chapter 3, he speaks about, and in this first part, it is his instructions. And certainly there's nothing wrong with outward appearance. There's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with uh, being modest and, listen, and, and, and wanting to, to dress, you know, in, in a good way. Listen, I'm all for that. That's, that's awesome. Go ahead. But you be warned tonight, those things are not what win a spouse to the Lord. If you're in a relationship that's unequally yoked at this point in time, you have a lost husband or a lost wife. You can dress as good as you want to, but those aren't the qualities that will lead your spouse to Jesus Christ. Those aren't the qualities that's going to lend themselves to, uh, to uh, enjoying Christ in your home. It's the spiritual qualities. It's the things only Christ can do to make you the husband, to make you the wife that he's called you to be. And it's what Christ wants you to understand. And if you're here tonight, and listen, like I said, you're still in school, you're still in college. These are the qualities you need to be praying God. Listen, you send me someone that, that we're like-minded in and what we want God to be in our life. Listen to what he says here about, the, listen, the ideal of marriage. He says here in verse uh, 7, when he speaks about the wife, then he speaks about the husband here in verse 7. And he comes down here that he talks about the husbands that you should dwell with them according to knowledge, give honoring to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. And then he makes this statement as being heirs together of the grace of life. And that's what we want to preach on tonight. Being heirs together of the grace of life. Now, how does that strike you as I just pull out that portion of scripture? Does that strike you as something that certainly that God has available? Uh, something that God desires to do for, the, for a husband and wife that want to team up and be a worker for the Lord. <laughs> you know, when you think about a husband and wife and you think about marriage, when I go all the way back, uh, just for a few minutes, to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to read back, going all the way back to uh, listen to the, the, the foundational institution that, that, that God ordained at the very beginning, that of marriage and the importance uh, that, uh, that the Lord placed on marriage, uh, that even uh, as God had very much a great purpose and even not making uh, the man and the woman at the same time, but yet uh, to, uh, to make the man first and help them to see that, listen, I have a need. <laughs> And when the time would come, as God ordained that time in which uh, to bring uh, the woman onto the scene, listen to what he says in Genesis in chapter 2, verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and, and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. <laughs> Therefore shall a man leave his father and, cleave, and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be, what does it say there? Should be one. It shall be one flesh. That she is to be that help meet for man. The two parts of that, of that phrase, uh, to be a help meet, to be a help, that one that uh, is uh, brought alongside the man to help him. And that word meet, you know, talking about how that it's one that's compatible, that's fit for him. You know, throw away the idea that there's all these kind of fishing to see God's got someone for you. <laughs> Just as sure as he made one for Adam, he's got one for you. And it is God that ordains these things. It is God that, that prepares these beforehand. And it is you that God wants to, to, to look to him. Because there's some things that he's got planned, things that he can do that no one else can do. And it's things that, that last not just for the time of till death do us part, but things that will honor him for all eternity. And tonight... My goal, my desire, and my heart is that you can see the value of eternity now. Right here, right now. When I think about now, even and if we see the institution of marriage here, I, I go to uh, even Ephesians in chapter 5 and I see uh, the highest plane 
that marriage is, to, is intended to, to, to be on this earth and is intended to show a living, breathing picture of what is to come. It is a, marriage is to be a picture of Christ and His church. That as both in their role uh, submit themselves to allow the Lord God to have His way in their life, that the husband would love his life, uh, love his wife, <laughs> excuse me, love his wife, <laughs> That the wife, uh, listen, would honor and, and be subjected to her husband. And that you can't ask one to do one if the other hadn't done their part. That they go together. The teaching is together. And that they understand that they, just as it's written in Genesis, that listen, that they come together and they're one. And just like there's a reason and a need for it to help me, that there are things that, listen, that as a part of the man that, that he can't do on his own. That he needs the help of his wife, or it wouldn't be accomplished. That I, want, I want to begin to help put on your mind that even uh, from a spiritual point of view, that there are things in your walk with the Lord that you need the help of your spouse. That there are things that God has ordained that, 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 that he wants fulfilled, listen, within your marriage and the time and the years that you are together. And it's a beautiful picture, Brother Nathan. It's a beautiful picture. When I come back down here to 1 Peter chapter 3, now look back now at this phrase, heirs together of the grace of life. I want to talk about heirship for a few minutes tonight. You know, in the Bible that there's different ways and different, uh, all down through time in which things that were, were shown that, you, that you're to be an heir of. You think about just to build a base foundation of heirship uh, that should your mother or your father pass or something and, or if you live long enough that you'll have, that you'll have things that are, are, are given uh, to you. You didn't work for none of it. Someone else did. <laughs> but because of your relationship to that person that you're granted that, you see. You take ownership of it. And there's different, oh, it's a beautiful study that of heirship and certainly not it, we, it's not our intention to go through all the way through that, but we want to listen to, uh, list a few things because I want to get something on your mind, something that, that God has ordained. And listen, I know certainly full well uh, that the oaths, uh, listen, uh, of a marriage is until death do us part. But I'm also here to tell you that there are things that God honors beyond the grave. And if we could see the importance of that tonight, it would change our marriage today <laughs> and that going forward and what we value. You know, when I go to the book of uh, Romans in chapter 8, and just to, to put forth there just a, a few examples for you tonight to understand that as a child of God, there are things uh, that, that God has ordained. Uh, listen, that, that uh, when <laughs> all you knew that you were a lost sinner and you needed salvation, and you trusted Christ and you were saved, and then the more you begin to learn about all the, how wonderful that the, the Lord is, that He didn't just save you, He didn't just redeem you. Uh, I might say from the bondage of sin but you belong to him now <laughs> he didn't just redeem you from sin and then pay you your sin debt and then just say well you just go on now down your way listen hope it all works out for you no he says come home with me <laughs> you belong to me you're going to live with me and along those lines that, that we think about in the book of Romans in chapter 8 that there are some things here uh, that we understand in Romans in chapter 8 that listen in verse 16 the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and if children the sin is done then it continues there's something that, that we're gifted there's something that listen that, that, that we didn't work for salvation we didn't work for this either we're gifted this he says and if children then heirs Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we, that we may also be glorified together. That listen, that, that we're heirs. That we're saved or we're children of God, we're heirs with him. And one day we're going to be glorified. I don't know, a child of God is not going to, listen, if you know Christ is your Savior, you're not one day going to be glorified. And you had nothing to do with that. But it's what Christ has gifted to us. 
And you think about that heirship, and certainly for all the children of God. And again, more we can say about that subject, but we want to use that just as an example to understand. Even in, go to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to give you another example of heirs. And as we build closer to what we want to impress upon your heart tonight with the help of God, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, that, that this is said concerning the family of Abraham. Hebrews in chapter 11, that the Bible speaks of Abraham as God would call him out in verse 8, by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. And how's that verse end? Heirs with him of the same promise. Now tonight, understand that there are some things that, listen, uh, that, that we, and we know concerning Israel, we know especially concerning Abraham, we know that God came to Abraham, he promised him some things. And we know that there are some things that when Jacob, that, listen, when Isaac came along, God would give him the same promise. And that when Jacob would come along, God would give him the same promise. That there are promises that, that, that listen, he has made, that, listen, that they collectively, listen, as a family, now, listen, we know that we we'll let her grow into the nation of Israel, but there are things specific. They're heirs together, is the point I'm trying to make. We know that Paul will teach in, in, in the book of Ephesians how that, uh, that the, which was a great mystery at that time, but God revealed it. That it's not just Jews that can receive the grace of God, but Jew and Gentile alike, uh, listen, uh, that uh, are, are able to receive the gift of everlasting life, to be joined in Christ. And a Jew is not greater than a Gentile or vice versa. Even something that we take for granted, but in the Bible times, if you go, if you go and study, uh, listen, the, the culture of the times, especially during the Roman Empire, that you find that women, uh, listen, you want to talk about uh, third-rate citizens, you go and study it, uh, they were well, listen, uh, they were thought of, uh, listen, lesser than even the children in many instances throughout the Roman Empire, that they had uh, n no value in uh, the common culture and attitude of the times. And then uh, the, the message of Jesus Christ comes along. Uh, the message of the gospel, uh, listen, comes along. And you find, uh, listen, uh, the value. Uh, listen, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Uh, listen, uh, that if you will trust Christ, you will receive the grace of everlasting life. And God's got a place for you in his church. He's got a place for everyone. He's got a role. Just like he's got a role within the family, he's got a role within the church. And those don't contradict each other. They just build, you see. In fact, they're, they're quite in unison. In fact, you can't talk about the roles within the church without first talking about the roles within the family. It all goes together, you see. Well, I think about that now when I come back to 1 Peter chapter 3. And what I want you to see here is not only is he talking about, uh, listen, men and women, but he's talking about those that are married. He's talking about the husband and the wife specifically. And he makes it known that listen, that you're heirs together. And, and that term, heirs together, that listen, in other words, what's available uh, the, 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 when you join together in, in holy matrimony, uh, listen, and, and you uh, trust Christ as your Savior, uh, listen, and you uh, walk with Christ, and listen, it's not just you and your husband, it's like we teach, listen, with, uh, listen, the threefold cord, cord, it's you and your spouse, and it's the Lord. And, and that's a reality in your home. That's a reality in your family. Uh, listen, uh, that, uh, as a husband, that listen, you understand, uh, listen, with great, uh, listen, uh, uh, humility and with great, uh, listen, uh, reverence, uh, that listen, I can't be uh, the leader of spirit in my home if, if Christ, listen, doesn't lead me, if he doesn't guide me, if he doesn't teach me, and if I don't submit unto his teaching, if I don't submit to his lordship, how in the world can I be a spiritual head in my home? And then you have, listen, the godly wife, uh, listen, that understands that, listen, uh, that she does things as it's fit in the Lord, her, her own life. That her desire above all else is to honor the Lord. We made this statement leave last night, uh, I think it was last night, that, listen, understand that there, there, even in your marriage, there needs to be one that you jointly love more than each other, and that's the Lord. He's to be the first one. And when he comes and is welcome into your marriage, uh, listen, understand uh, that he makes you, uh, listen, as he says here, that there is something that is available, uh, listen, that is so wonderful and so beautiful. He says, you're heirs together. 
And that phrase there, you go back to the Greek, and what that really means, it means that you're co-heirs. That you're participants in common. You're together. You're one. That you're heirs together of the thing of the spiritual grace of God. And of things that he values, not only now, but he'll value, he'll put on display in eternity. And that is something that you just can't get with a 401k. <laughs> That's just something you get, you just can't get with anything that you can pay, pay money for. It's only possible through a relationship with Christ. To understand the truth of this. And the Bible is full of many examples of husbands and wives that they were a husband and wife team for the Lord. That he meant everything, not only to them individually, as we talked about last week, but even together. Listen, what they, they, they had come together, and the commonality that they had is, listen, that we're together, and not just to live for 30 or 40 years, but we're, listen, or 50 years, whatever it would be. I think about Brother Jack, Sister Bonnie. Listen, y'all may not know, but tonight, today, they're celebrating 60 years of marriage. And that is a wonderful testimony. But I'll tell them publicly, and I'd like to tell all married couples, that, listen, God's got more that's going to last even longer than 60 years. <laughs> If you'll follow him. Heirs together of the grace of life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he talks about how the, some inheritance that we have here. That, that in verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance. He's not only saved us and gave us a lively hope, but he's taken us somewhere. There's something that he has for us. He says, to an inheritance. Incorruptible, undefiled, that faith not away, preserved in heaven for you. He says in verse 13, to gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Things that will be revealed at his coming. I think about many uh, husband and wife teams that honor the Lord. You know, for the God's promise to Abraham to be fulfilled you know it also involved his wife Sarah y'all understand that don't you <laughs> those are things they realized together and God hadn't forgot them either they're going to realize it together on down the line that the things they shared what, what are you trying to say that the things they shared together they held in common those are going to be things that they those were things of God and the things of God, they will enjoy for all eternity. Listen, husband and wife teams. I think about not only Abraham and Sarah, but I think about Aquila and Priscilla. Oh, listen, they love the Lord dearly. I think about over in the book of Acts. Uh, listen, how that, that in, in chapter 18, uh, how that when the Lord came to them there, or excuse me, when Paul uh, came to, excuse me, to Antioch, or that, to Corinth, excuse me, to Corinth, uh, that he was in need of some friends. He needed some help. And God sent him a wonderful husband and wife team, Aquila and Priscilla. And he joined in with them. And they labored together. And it began a wonderful partnership that as these people, this married couple, Aquila and Priscilla, as they followed the Lord and they were used greatly of the Lord. In fact, when I go to the book of Romans at the, at the end of the book in Romans in chapter 16, I think about some statements, uh, listen, that he makes here about how much he valued. Uh, listen, uh, this married couple, Aquila and Priscilla, he says here in verse 3 of Romans chapter 16, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers, in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. <laughs> and what you'll find is that they were very vital in the church at Rome. They were very vital at Ephesus, or Corinth. They were very vital, uh, listen, uh, in other places, uh, that he says, salute them, that they're workers, they're laborers together. And they put the Lord first in their marriage. And they were used greatly of the Lord. I think about a family that, that Paul records uh, that being so thankful for at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 
He says here in verse 15, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, in my chapter right, 16, verse 15. He says, I beseech you, brethren, and you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That word addicted, listen, you want to talk about the folks that are addicted today, usually that's a bad word. Man, they've got an addiction. Oh, Lord, what did they get into now? Man, they are hooked on some bad stuff. <laughs> Brother Stephen, this family wasn't hooked on bad stuff. They were hooked on the Lord. <laughs> that's kind of a corny saying, but listen, you don't change the truth of it. And they prove their love for the Lord, listen, uh, by helping his people, by helping grow the church, uh, listen, uh, by ministering to the needs of others. And I'm here to tell you, the Lord didn't forget that. In Hebrews in chapter 6, listen to what he says. Hebrews in chapter 6. And then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 3 and we're going to wind our own down. Hebrews chapter 6, listen to what it says. Verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. God doesn't forget that. He doesn't forget the families that honor him. He doesn't forget those, listen, that, that husband and wife that, listen, not only raise their children, but they, listen, they pass the, the spiritual baton to the children, to the next generation, and to the next generation, and to the next generation. And I'm going to say this very clearly. And I'm going to be mighty selfish. I don't want to just enjoy my family here on this earth. I want to be able to enjoy the person of Christ with them for all eternity. How about you? I want there to be things that, listen, that as eternity rolls on, that we can praise Christ for together. First Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to put this on your mind and as we begin to close. And certainly not, I know that, listen, that the marriage vow, listen, it certainly ends with the, till death do its part. I understand that. But I also know as God designed it for that husband and wife to be children of God. And therefore, they both jointly live together to accomplish what only God has intended they could accomplish together during the time they are together. I'm here to tell you now, God does not forget that. This is a very familiar scripture reading, speaking of the judgment of Christ. And certainly, when we are raptured, when that day of Christ comes, and we rapture or rapture and we meet the Lord in the air and we receive that body like unto Christ and we see him just as he is when we hear that personal call. When that time comes, and we're out of here. The first order of business is that we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The first order of business. While that tribulation period begins on this earth, the church as a judgment. The Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. And the first, and don't you forget, you get this out of order and you get a lot of things out of order. The first order of business is we're going to stand before the Lord and we're going to be judged, not for salvation. But did you love him? That's all he asked Peter, wasn't it, Brother Stephen? Do you love me? Lovest thou me more than these? If so, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. How can you say you love God whom you haven't seen if you don't love those whom you do see? Well, he talks about our life and he sums it all up like into this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, about how there's only one foundation. Dear friends, there's only one name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Do you know him tonight? I pray you do. He's the only name under heaven, even among men, whereby you must be saved. There's no other foundation. 
But tonight, Christ wants you not only to trust in him for soul salvation, he wants you to build on him. He wants you to build your life on him. He wants you to build your marriage on him. He wants you to build your family upon him. Listen to what he says. For other foundation can no man lay than as lay, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 11, now verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by a fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide with which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Very simple teaching. That which is not done to the honor and glory of the Lord is represented by wood, hay, and stubble, and fire burns that up, and it's gone forever. But those things done in love and honor of the Lord, all the fire does is it purifies it. And, you, and those are things that are accomplished solely by His amazing grace. The very same grace that saved your soul. The very same power that raised Christ up from the dead. The very same power that gives you your, uh, your body like unto Christ and all that He's gifted unto you. The same, very same power that He enables you to live for Him. And what He does, I've already told you how He wants to put you on display here in this life. If your focus is singular. And I'm here to tell you, not by the word of God, he wants to put that on display for all eternity. In Ephesians chapter 2, he speaks about how in the, in the, in the ages to come. <laughs> Ephesians in chapter 2, he talks about the grace of God and the sustaining power, purpose of the Lord. Verse 6, he hath raised us up together and made us sit in together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 of Ephesians 2, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And dear child of God, if there's anything you want to be able to enjoy and join, and join in praising Christ with your spouse down here, it better have been done for him down here. Because all the time that we spent living our life for ourselves, even as a child of God, You've used your marriage for selfish purposes. You've sought after the things of the world. You think you're going to be enjoying that as heirs together of His grace in eternity? Certainly not. But when we leave out of that judgment, Brother Stephen, all that's going to be left is that which honors and glorifies the Lord. It's purified. And it's made possible by His grace. I had a discussion one time with, in my family home, I want to share it with you, and, and I'm sure it's a discussion that I'm sure like many of you have had in your homes perhaps, I, I can't help but believe it. Mom and Daddy, what's it going to be like in heaven? Hmm. Mom and Daddy, we going to know each other? We going to know all these other people? Any, of, any parents ever had that children ask you that question? I see a lot of smiling faces, I'm sure you have. And I want to tell you something that blessed my heart. And she's going to kick me when we go down the road, but that's okay. Something that my wife shared in one of those family meetings one night. Yeah, we're going to know each other. There's plenty of Bible proof about that. If you trust Christ, yeah, listen, we're going to enjoy Christ for eternity. But I thank God something that my wife said. She said, what are we going to remember? What are we going to know? And she made this statement, all that we've done together for Christ, we're going to enjoy that forever. And that just clicked. Wow. I love that answer. All that we, when we come together with a singular purpose, and that you do as a married couple, that you and your heart, and you and your heart, and you come together in one, and you desire to honor Christ, it will not be forgotten. Don't waste your marriage on things that's going to burn up in judgment. That's what I'm trying to tell you in that. <laughs> not only will you be used of God and to be a strengthen to your, strengthening to your church here in this life and to your family, 
but you're going to have a better resurrection in glory. You're going to have an abundant entrance into his kingdom, as Peter wrote. You're going to have more of those things that when you see Christ that you can lay down and thank him for, for what you and you alone are made possible by, by the power of your amazing grace. Tonight, those are things that Christ and Christ alone make possible. Heirs together of the grace of life. Will you seek it tonight? While we sing, this will be the message.